No, we're still staying focused on the breath. I'm going to make a few remarks on the topic of proactive practice. I think it's best that you listen to it while you're meditating. Because it talks about the perspective you get when you're focused on the present moment. When the Buddha talks about staying with the present moment or being with the present moment, it's not just a place where you stay or be. He's constantly saying there's work to be done. You don't know how much time you have, but you do know you have the present moment. So you focus on what you can do right now. This implies, of course, that your present moment is not totally determined by the past. If it were, you wouldn't make any decisions. You'd be sitting here just watching things that are inevitably happening. You wouldn't have any control. In fact, sometimes there are some meditation methods that will have you just say, okay, whatever comes up is coming up from the past karma, I'll just be with that and be okay. But the Buddha was very much opposed to that idea that the present is determined by the past. He wasn't the sort of person who would go out and argue with people. But there were two issues that he would actually go out and seek people and ask, did you really teach this? And then point out that the dangers of those teachings. One was the teaching of determinism, that what you're experiencing right now is shaped by the past, either things you did in the past or some creator God did in the past, or just impersonal fate. The other was the teaching of randomness, that there was no sense, there was no pattern of cause and effect at operating the universe. Things were just very randomly happening, and so you just grab whatever happens you can. In both cases, the Buddha said, you're making it impossible to take on any responsibility for the choices you're making in the present moment. If what you're doing right now is determined by something that was done in the past, then people kill and steal and cheat, and they're not really responsible, and they can't change their ways. And the whole purpose of the Buddhist teachings is that you can change your ways. You're acting in ways that are causing suffering, you can learn how to act in ways that don't. In fact, the Buddha saw that as a teacher's primary duty, to give you a basis for deciding what should and should not be done. But if everything is predetermined, even the idea of should be done doesn't make any sense. We also see the power of the present moment in his analogy of the salt crystal. He said, you may have bad karma coming in from the past, but think of it as being like a big lump of salt. If you put the salt in a little tiny cup of water, you can't drink the water. Because the salt is so much bigger than the water, too much for the water to take in. But if you put that same lump of salt into a clean, clear river, you can still drink the water in the river because there's so much more water. Now the water here stands for your state of mind in the present moment. This, this is, the, the large river is characterized by a mind that is developing thoughts of unlimited goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. It's developed in virtue, developed in discernment, and is trained so that the mind is not overcome easily by either pleasure or pain. In the same way, I mean, your mind has these qualities, it's like that large river, then whatever past karma you've done in the past, it doesn't really pain you that much. So it gives you, this gives you a sense that things are not totally determined by the past. They're determined largely also by your state of mind in the present moment. In fact, the Buddha actually gives priority to the present moment. There's some statements that are scattered around the canon. It's interesting that they're very rarely discussed. One is the, the verse, or the pair of verses that starts the Dhammapada. The, the mind is the forerunner of all things. Everything you experience is shaped first by the mind. And that's quite a radical statement. 
This follows in with another statement that all dhammas, all things that you experience through the senses, are rooted in desire. It's because of your desires that you have these experiences. So you're not simply on the receiving end of experience. The mind is not just a byproduct of physical processes. The mind is actually the agent. You see this in his analysis of the present moment, when he talks in Dependent Core Rising about how suffering arises. You look at the list of factors, it's quite long. And halfway down the list is your experience of contact at the senses. Sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. That's our idea of what the present moment is, but the Buddha says the present moment is shaped by a lot of factors that go before that, including the factors that he calls fabrication, intention, attention. These are the things that prime you either to suffer or not to suffer from what happens at the senses. And all of these things have a purpose. When the Buddha talks about the role of fabrication, he talks about three. There bodily fabrication, which is the breath, verbal fabrication, which is the way you talk to yourself, and mental fabrication, your feelings and the labels you have to apply to things. He says, we shape our experience of the rest of the aggregates through fabrication, and fabrication does it for a purpose. We take the raw material coming in from the past and we shape it into a feeling, we shape it into a perception. Because we have purposes in using these things. So it's our purposes that determine how we're going to experience things. And in the list of causal factors, you can, the factor of intention, as I said, comes prior to your experience of the senses. That intention is your present karma. The senses, that's your past karma. So your present karma is actually prior to your past karma, as you experience it. And there's another passage where the Buddha equates that past karma with your experience of the world. This is how we know the world, is through the senses. And so even our experience of the world is shaped by our desires. The question is, how is this possible? How can present karma come before past? Well, look at the point of view where the Buddha is coming from. He's coming from an analysis of the, of the present moment, analyzed in the present moment. He's not looking at the present moment as it fits into the narratives of history or the confines of the world. In fact, for him, the narratives and the world are things that are contained in the present moment. After all, this was the point of view that where he gained his awakening, and his third knowledge, where he was looking at things purely in the present moment in terms of the intentions and views that shape the present moment. This was after coming from two knowledges, where first he saw his previous lifetimes, the second one where he saw all beings are dying and being reborn throughout the universe based on their actions. Those first two knowledges were, in, were expressed in terms of worlds and beings. Whereas the third knowledge and the focusing on the present moment had none of those terms at all. The question is, how do you become a being? It's based on your desire. How do you understand the world? Well, it's how you experience things that the senses, and those, those experiences that the senses are shaped by your desires. And then the question is, how do we take on an identity as a being? How do we shape the world? That's the process of the Buddha of all becoming. But it happens here in the present moment. The present moment is the context for your understanding of time, for your understanding of worlds, for your understanding of beings. The present moment comes first. When you take that perspective, then you begin to see that if you can change your desires in the present moment, it's going to have a huge impact. You are not, you don't have to define yourself in the confines of the world that other people are defining you. You don't have to define yourself in the confines of your old narratives. You can step out of the world, you can step out of the narratives by stepping into the present moment. And look at these, looking at these things as processes rooted in your desire. 
Then the question becomes, well, what desires are skillful and which ones are not? That's where the work is done. That is our work in the present moment. It's to look at our desires now. So are they really leading us in the direction we want? We all want happiness. But our desires working in line with that desire, with that over overarching wish, or are they at cross purposes? And the Buddha's analysis of the present gives us a much larger scope for how we can change the way we act, change the way we shape our world, shape our sense of ourselves. So we don't have to be limited by our old ways of defining ourselves, or the way it's other people define us. There's a lot that can be done right here. But as the Buddha said, we don't know how much time we have, but we do know we have the present moment. So let's make the best use of what we got. And with those thoughts in mind, you can open your eyes.